welcome to the very first lab lecture. And uh, so uh, we're going to do this very much like what we were doing with lectures, uh, but there'll be separate content and separate titles. Um, so this is census. This is a two-part lab. Uh, very first part we're going to be doing is the ear. Then we'll be working on the eye. And then the third lab, endocrine. So as we go through this, this PowerPoint covers ear and then the eye and the endocrine separate. So uh, as we walk through this, I want to start off by dividing up the ear um, in the uh, three anatomical regions that it possesses. Um, first, I'll go over and show some diagrams, and then there are uh, uh, labeled model images that will be on the content of the course that you'll be able to use to study from. And at the end of this PowerPoint, um, there will be blank versions of those models here uh, that you'll use uh, for examinations as well. So these images will be for the test and also some of these images here that are histology, smaller pieces, and then these are purely for study. So what we want to do is really to get started and say, okay, we have three anatomical divisions, the external ear, middle ear, inner ear. So as you look at this, the external ear can be divided starting here. We've seen this in the lecture notes as well. If you've watched lecture before lab, uh, you see the tympanic membrane and outside of that is external ear behind that's the middle ear and everything inside here for hearing is the inner ear. So the external ear is the visible portion of the ear. That's what we can see. That's what's going to have our ear lobes. And our ear lobes uh, that we see, the visible portion, is there to collect sound waves, acting kind of like what you might see a satellite dish does for a certain signal. So will uh, this thing do for sound. And uh, so it collects it and directs any sound waves, any vibrations in the air towards the eardrum so it can vibrate. Then we see the middle ear, that's the part, it was located inside the skull, it's located in a portion of the skull called the petrous portion. That was the part of the temporal bone that we saw in AMP1 lab where uh, the internal acoustic meatus was attached to and on the other side of that was the external acoustic meatus. Uh, that sound is associated there. And this is the amplification and transmission area. So this is where sound gets amplified. It is like an internal chamber in which uh, acts kind of like the body of a guitar, how that would amplify sound waves or the body of a drum to amplify those sound waves. And then associated inside there will be ear bones that will transmit those sound waves uh, into the right part of the inner ear to be turned into hearing. So we're basically going to convert sound waves into vibrations and then vibrations into pressure waves and then pressure waves into a neurological signal. Now, inner ear, that's going to be associated here, guys, to any of the things for equilibrium and hearing. Equilibrium is balance. That's me knowing up from uh, down and where my body is, uh, being able to have an, a sense of my balance. And then hearing, of course, is sound hearing. And as you can see, the external ear, in, middle ear, and internal ear here and the different components to those. Now the external ear, if we were to take this slice here out and we were to go in, we would see that it contains a flap, the large flap, uh, the external fold, what you would say the ear lobes are the auricle. Another name for that is the pinna. Auricle or pinna or the ear lobes, they gather sound waves. They act kind of like a satellite dish directing sound waves into the external acoustic meatus, which ends here at the um, tympanic membrane. So the sound waves go towards the tympanic membrane. Now inside this duct, inside this external acoustic meatus or auditory canal, there is a series of specialized glands called ceraminous glands, that produce, there are very specialized types of sebaceous glands that make secretions that we know as earwax or cerumen. Then there is the tympanic membrane. We can just see it here. It acts as the wall of the external ear to the middle ear. It is the dividing line between it. And when a sound wave hits it, it vibrates. So we're going to turn sound waves, like the sound of my voice, and as that 
sound wave is these waves of pressure enter in the ear canal they will vibrate this tympanic membrane and those vibrations then will go on to produce pressure waves in the inner ear that will go on to make neural input so as we go on let's look at the middle ear now behind the uh, right here behind our tympanic membrane we have our middle ear here and the middle ear contains a cavity called the tympanic cavity tympanic cavity is going to be all this space right here behind the uh behind the uh, tympanic membrane eardrum there's going to be an auditory tube we're going to talk about the pharyngeal tympanic tube or eustachian tube and that's going to be attached to your pharynx so what happens is it's right it starts in the pharynx part of the pharynx behind the nasal cavity the first part of the pharynx we'll get into that when we get into the respiratory system and digestive system um, it's called the nasopharynx so it starts up in the nasopharynx up in the pharynx and it goes into the middle ear and this acts to kind of um, to equalize pressure in the in the ear into the tympanic cavity so because it goes from the pharynx to the tympanic cavity we call it pharyngotympanic tube it was named after a guy named eustachio so eustachian tube or auditory tube and then the three auditory ossicles the malus the incus and stapes oftentimes commonly referred to as the hammer the anvil and the stirrup but these take the vibrations of the tympanic membrane and transmit those to the inner ear so the inner ear can convert those uh, so sound waves being turned into vibrations being turned into pressure waves to be turned into nerve impulses now there are two muscles that are associated to here now these two muscles are controlled by cranial nerves now just as a quick reminder for cranial nerves um let me pull this thing up it's been actually working today it appears it's working pretty well and we know we have 12 cranial nerves and i want to do a very quick why i have you review of that because a lot of students may be one come in very weak on the cranial nerves and there are 12 of them now remember the first cranial nerve olfactory you can smell the olfactory so you only have one nose so we're going to draw a number one for the nose you have two eyes optic so let's draw number twos for the eyes and if you take a uh, three and turn it on its side it looks like an m cranial nerve number three uh oculomotor number four trochlear number five trigeminal uh number six controls lateral rectus so that is your uh abducens or abducent because it abducts the eye the lateral rectus number seven on both sides of the face so let's take sevens on both sides of face facial nerve number eight let's make ears out of eights that is your vestibulocochlear nerve vestibulocochlear nerve or auditory nerve for hearing but also for balance number nine so here in our mouth let's draw a mouth then let's finish our nine where it looks like a tongue is sticking out nine glossopharyngeal throat and tongue number 10 controls everything down below the body so let's put the 10 down there for vagus and then number 11 controls out of your shoulder um, some of your shoulder and other things like that spinal accessory or accessory and number 12 we're going to put that inside the nine loop uh, because it controls tongue uh, stuff um, hypoglossal now that's just all of them but we're going to be really more focused here on uh, for this particular uh, senses is two five seven and eight will be our big ones here and then autonomic nervous system um, uh, uh, three seven nine and ten so anyway these are just kind of a recap I always like to go over those with my students uh, just to remind them now there are two muscles of the middle ear one is the tensor tympani and the other is the stapedius muscles and these two muscles tensor tympani muscle stapedius muscle tensor tympani it is attached to the malus its insertion point of attachment that does produce movement when the muscle contracts insertion malus and it pulls to tighten and limits the mo movement of the malus but also the tympanic membrane so it tenses tympanic membrane and it's controlled by trigeminal so tenses tympanic membrane tensor tympani muscle controlled by trigeminal tensor tympani trigeminal ttt tensor tympani trigeminal ttt
stapedius muscle, as you can see, stapedius muscle, this is inserted on state B, so it reduces movement to state B's. Now, what would these do? If your tympanic membrane could move, that movement, vibration, would cause the vibration of malus inca stapes, which will cause the stapes to produce pressure waves in the inner ear, which will then cause uh, those pressure waves to be turned into neural impulses. And if this happens, then what you have is um, more sound being stimulated, more stimulation, more sound you will be aware of. Reduce the movement of these muscles, less stimulation, so you won't hear as much. So these reduce the intensities of sounds by using the trigeminal nerve to control tensor tympani. Tensor tympani, trigeminal, to reduce the movement of the malus, thereby reducing the tympanic membrane's movement. Then to come in, take the stapedius muscle, who controls stapes. Now, stapes is a little bit like a little toddler who's in the store. If you take them to Target, and they go by, and they see the toys, and they go, I want a toy, I want a toy, I want a toy. And you can say, no. And they go, but I want a toy. And they hop up and down, loudly, just shaking and screaming, jumping up and down. And you reach out and grab them and say, you stay still, calm down. You settle down. And you grab them, you are the tensor tympani and stapedius muscle. Stapedius muscle, you would be in this case, grabs a hold of the stapes and prevents it from jumping up and down and moving and vibrating, causing increased pressure in the inner ear, where all the sound will be produced. So we can reduce that function as well to reduce sound stimulation. So what we have here is controlled by the facial nerve. Stapedius, S-T, facial, F, S-T-F-U. Shut the frick up, okay? <laughs> so, if you want somebody to shut up, STFU, stapedius facial. Okay, it's an easy way to remember it. I know it's a little bit risque, but let's go risque. Okay. Now, the middle ear here, we can see the tympanic cavity here, and the tympanic cavity holding the auditory ossicles, holding the tensor tympani, and the... Uh, stapedius muscles and you can see the uh, here are stapes grabbed on by the stapedius the uh, malus grabbed on by tensor tympani which is then attached itself here to the tympanic membrane now auditory ossicles you can see they're very small uh, the malus incus and stapes now i will have you identify those on models uh not here like this but there will be models where i'll have you identify them so uh but we'll talk i'll show you the images again now the ear uh, has two components here that we want to talk about. There's two labyrinths. There's a bony labyrinth and a membranous labyrinth. So what I'm going to do here is discuss a little bit of this, then we're going to do a drawing together. But the bony labyrinth is the bony area. This is this is osseous tissues, and it's underneath of it is a membranous labyrinth. So what we want to do here is on my drawing, we're going to start out by drawing what kind of looks like a sausage. And we're going to draw this sausage like that. Then we're going to come into here and we're going to put a smaller sausage inside that sausage. And so we have like a sausage and a sausage, a tube and a tube. Okay. Now, this tube and a tube here, we have our bony labyrinth here. Bony labyrinth. Now, sorry, I... Sometimes can't write. Oh, I forgot to erase a little bit more. There we go. And uh, bony labyrinth. And then over here is our membranous labyrinth. And I hope you draw this with me. So you will see the bony labyrinth controls them, can, covers up, protects the membranous labyrinth. Now, what you will find the bony labyrinth is going to be part of the semicircular canals, the vestibule, and the cochlea. Okay, that's, that's the three major bony portions. Now, inside these will be a fluid called perilymph. So let's talk about the semicircular canals. They surround the ducts. That would be the, the duct would be the membranous labyrinth found in the canals. Vestibule, bony labyrinth, covers the membranous labyrinth, saccule, and utricle. 
cochlea is going to look like a snail shell, and we're going to see it covers the cochlear duct in a minute. And then the perilymph is the fluid found there. So what we want to do now is on our drawing, on this drawing, I want you guys to come in on here. Let's write perilymph in here. And let's write perilymph in here. So now we know that fluid perilymph surrounds the membranous labyrinth. Okay, it's like the force. It surrounds it, penetrates it. Okay, moves through it. It's like the force, Luke. Okay, so we're then going to see that there's two windows, or two windows associated here. These two windows are called the windows, are called the oval window and the round window. The oval window is going to be associated to your stapes, and the round window is going to be associated to uh, preventing auditory echo. And I'm going to talk about them a little bit more. But right here, what we want to do is draw an oval and then draw a circle. Of course, this is the oval window. And we want to draw stapes here. And stapes. I'm just going to abbreviate it as because I don't have room to write stapes. Stapes there. And then right here is our round window, the round window. Now what happens is your oval window vibrates when the stapes vibrates and moves. Stapes is going to be sitting on our oval window somewhat like a little kid jumping up and down, throwing a fit in the target, going, I want a toy, I want a toy, I want a toy, and you reach out and grab him and say, settle down, calm down, stop doing that. And you grab it and produce that reduce that movement. So that's what the stapedius muscle does. Is it's there to, to take the stapy stop moving, and it creates pressure waves in what's called the scalar vestibule, or we're going to call it vestibular duct later on. So I'm going to say vestibular duct. That is my preferred term for it. It's also called the scalar vestibule, vestibular duct. Here, now the vestibular duct. What happens when that uh, stapes moves? We produce pressure waves inside this duct. We make the perilymph start to slosh around like liquid stuck inside of a container. And that sloshing, for example, might just do this. It might just go around and over here and be in a thing called the tympanic duct and the tympanic duct is going to be where sorry about that the tympanic duct is going to be uh, leading to your round window and that's where the sound waves get dissipated at so what's happening here is your round window dissipates pressure waves preventing auditory echo in the tympanic duct or scala tympani now the membranous labyrinth this is the membranous stuff located inside the bony labyrinth this is going to be found in here. Now, what we're going to see is it has endolymph. So what we're going to do on this drawing right here is then we're going to write inside here is endolymph. Endolymph. Okay. Now, the endolymph will be found in parts of the membranous labyrinth. Two major components. Vestibular complex, which is composed of the utricle and saccule. That's the part of the membranous labyrinth found in the vestibule. And then the semicircular ducts, which are found in the semicircular canals. The vestibular complex and the cochlear duct. Those are the two major components of membranous labyrinth. The vestibular complex contains the utricle and saccule found in the vestibule. And the semicircular ducts are the membranous labyrinths found in the semicircular canals. Canals surround the ducts. The cochlear duct is the membranous labyrinth found in the cochlea. And what I'm going to do here <clears throat> is I'm going to go into this. We've labeled two ducts. Now we're going to say this is cochlear duct. So this means this is the cochlea. 
and we're going to talk about that in a moment. I'll tell you kind of a little bit why I did this and what's going on. Okay. So cochlear duct is the membrane assignment found only inside the cochlea. Now we're going to talk more about this and we'll get into this a little as we go through the lab. So as you can see here, we have bony labyrinth on the outside, bony material, and underneath that is perilymph. If I were to take part of the uh, one of the semicircular canals and ducts and slice through it, I would see this. Then we would see our membranous labyrinth and then their endolymph inside. Okay, This would be a schematic outline of what you see. And then if this, what I'm looking at here, is what this is, this end, except here I have the two windows. All right. Now, the inner ear, as we said, you have bony labyrinth surrounding membranous labyrinth. Bony labyrinth in this creamy white, beigey color. Blue is the membranous labyrinth. And remember, you have the uh, what is called the vestibular complex, which is composed of the vestibule and the semicircular canals. The semicircular ducts are found inside the canals. Then what you will see is the utricle and saccule, utricle and saccule, utricle, saccule are found inside the area called the vestibule. Then the cochlear duct is found only in cochlea. Okay, so now if we were to go to the vestibule, and we go right in here, the vestibule, this is this area right here, you will see these things right here, here and here. These are called macula. And this is what this is. So if we were to go into our utricle and saccule, we would find in here is a collection of things found inside the vestibule called macula. They are collections of hair cells. What are hair cells? Hair cells are specialized kinds of neurons. They are called mechanoceptors. They have their mechanoceptors. The macula is clusters of hair cells, specialized cells called mechanoceptors. Now remember a mechanoceptor is a cell that is stimulated by mechanical distortion. What does that mean? If I bend it, push on it, distort it, squeeze it, push it, pull it, tug it, bend it, squish it, it fires. And these mechanoceptors here, they use those mechanically gated ion channels I talked about in AMP1 in my class. And what we'll see is these hair cells will stick up these little hairs, cilia. We're going to see them a little bit later on called kinocilium. And there's many kinocilium, uh, there's one kinocilium, sorry, one kinocilium, the long kinocilium, Kind of long, kind of long, kind of long. Like you said, kind of long. It's kind of long, guys. Kind of cilium. And then stereocilia, there's many of them. They're shorter, shorter stereocilia, usually about 80 to 100 of them. And they stick up both of these into this gelatinous material here. But these hair cells, these blue cells, are held up by these peachy color cells. Those are your supporting cells. And they hold it up. And did this gelatinous otolithic membrane, we call it, and this otolithic membrane material that's highly gelatinous has covered it, otoliths or staticonia, that are ear stones, granules of calcium carbonate, that act as extra weight to take this gelatinous material and bend it extensively whatever direction I bend in, telling me which way my head was moving. And when somebody goes into, let's say, an ear, nose, and throat doctor, and they're, he they're, they're dizzy, and they come in, they put them on a tilt table, and they come out work and be able to walk, that's what it's doing is this tilt table shaking the otoliths back into place. Now, remember, we said that there were semicircular ducts, and they are found inside the canal. So the canal surrounds the ducts. Canal, bony labyrinth, semicircular duct, membranous labyrinth. And this membranous labyrinth of a circular duct contains the receptors, the sensory receptors that can detect movement. And these sensory receptors are at the basis of every duct, as we'll see, and they allow the ducts to detect movement in the three primary 
um, uh, directions. So if I were to go here and I had an um, uh, your primary two dimensions, X and Y here, well, there also is one coming out at you and going backwards. The one moving forward and the one going out, and that's your z-axis. Think of that as x, y, z in three-dimensional space. You have these three dimensions here, x, y, and z for three dimensions, uh, length, width, depth. Well, that's what this is. Anterior, posterior, and lateral semicircular ducts detect the three dimensions in space. Now, an anterior semicircular duct would detect movements like if I were to shake my head, yes, nod my head, yes, that's vertical head mo movement. Will be another example of this. Front flips and back flips. Front flips, back flips. Excuse me, I keep hiccuping. I just ate lunch. Now, the posterior duct does head tilt. So if I were to take my head towards my shoulder, to the other shoulder, back to that, back to each shoulder from side to side, uh, tilting my head side to side like I don't know. Well, that would be posterior. Well, what if I were to do cartwheels? Do cartwheels. Well, that would be posterior um, duct as well. Then lateral would be if I were to shake my head no, that'd be like rotational motion. So that'd be rotation of the head. So if I were to take myself and I were to spin around in a circle and get dizzy, my lateral semicircular duct's once doing that. And it's lateral semicircular duct as that moves the fluid keeps spinning after you stop and that's why you feel dizzy after okay it's part of a major part of dizziness that makes you want to go walk around uh, uh you have a hard time going left and right you walk around stumbly all right so now at the base of every one of the semicircular ducts you will find a receptor so if you look here there are these little receptors here at the bottom of each one and these are called ampulla the ampulla has a gelatinous thing in it called a capula the capula the capula is this gelatinous material where are these things found these things are found, guys, at the base of each of the ducts, and around it are the endolymph. And when endolymph moves, it pushes on the capula. Now, the capula are gelatinous materials, and here we again have hair cells. And hair cells are being held up, and these hairs stick up into the capula. So when the capula moves, we move the hair cell. And that makes these mechanoceptor sensitive movement is because the capula moves it and bends it this way or that way. Kind of like an on-off switch or a, your light switches when you flip them on, up or down. Um, that's what this does. It flips that way or that way, turning it on or off. Now, the crista is the portion that has the cells that orient and hold the crista, crista ampullaris, holds the mechanoceptors, holds the hair cells up, and then the capula covers it, and when the capula bends, it bends and distorts the hairs of the hair cells, causing a stimulus, causes action potentials to generate, which causes these hair cells to alter the release of neurotransmitters, which will tell my sensory nerves I've moved in a certain direction, whether it's on or off, tells me something. It being on tells me I move one way. It being off tells me I move the other way. On or off tells me something, guys. Now, the hair cells, what you're going to see in the hair cells, is the hair cells, remember, have a very single long kind of cilium. It's kind of long. Then there's multiple stereocilia that are usually 80 to 100 of them in general. They all stick up into a gelatinous material, and whenever the hair cell bends one way or the other, it either stimulates it 
or inhibits it. And it stimulates it when you bend it towards the kind of cilium. Just to let you know, it. That's what, you're not going to get tested on that. Not in the lab. I always like to use my lab sometimes to feed in some of that lecture material and re-relate lab and lecture together to take the pressure because especially in an internet course like this, online course like this, you guys have, have, have got it really hard compared to other people. Okay, And I know you do. We're trying to do everything we possibly can. It's just I have things I have to work with. So let's look at this a little bit more. Let's go into the cochlea. What's the cochlea do? The cochlea here surrounds the cochlear duct. This is the bony labyrinth cochlea surrounding the cochlear duct. Now there are three ducts inside here. Cochlear duct. We saw the vestibular duct, cochlear duct, tympanic duct. Or scala vestibule, scala media, scala tympani. Now, what I would like you guys kind of take here is, is, is reorient with this diagram here that we've done before. We've done this together, uh, lecture and lamp. So now let's have this guy and we look at this. So we saw the scala vestibule vestibular duct when the oval window is when you have the stapes vibrating on it, it conducts the pressure waves into that, uh, that pressure waves from the oval window caused by stapes that was vibrating gets in here the perilymph starts to slosh around and as that does it goes around and surrounds our cochlear duct and that is the area where hearing is produced because the neurons the sensory receptors for hearing are found inside here and it's between the tympanic duct and vestibular duct or scala tympani and vestibule since it's between the two it's scala media now we're going to see the roof is called the vestibular membrane. Now, vestibular membrane would be right here. Uh, this would be the vestibular membrane. I'm just going to abbreviate it VM, uh, vestibular membrane. And I am sorry that my uh, uh, all my gaming channel alerts keep coming up. So now you guys will know that I'm a gaming nerd, but that's okay. And then the bottom of it's the basilar membrane. I just love to put on a cylindrical object BM. You know, that just makes everything look nice. Looks it look like a big old poopy. So here we are. So what we have is our basilar membrane is the basement. And as you can see, it separates your cochlear duct from the tympanic duct. The vestibular membrane, as you can see, is the roof. And it separates the cochlear duct from the vestibular duct. Think about the roof. A roof... Uh, as you guys may think that uh, if I were to go in here, since my drawing is working uh, a little bit better, let's say I had a little house here, and on my little house, there's a roof on that little house, and if I took this roof and I flipped it upside down, it would look like a V, wouldn't it? So that's what this thing looks like, is V, vestibular is an upside down roof. I know, my artistic endeavors are just amazing. Now, this guy here, the spiral organ, uh, or organ of corti, is located inside the cochlea. And it spirals throughout the entire cochlea. Going through like a giant cinnamon roll, it goes through the entire thing. And inside the spiral organ is where the hair cells are. As it spirals through, these hair cells are activated by movement. There will be stereocilia on these hair cells, but no kinocilium. Think about this. You hear in stereo. Listen to your stereo. Stereocilia, the hair cells that you use to hear, are only having stereocilia and no kinocilium. There is supporting cells that hold the hair cells up. Then we're going to see above the hair cells covering the stereocilia of hair cells is tectorial membrane. Now it gets the same from tecton, which means stonework, uh, dealing with stonework. Think of tectonic plates. Now, we're going to talk about the tectorial membrane in a minute, and it's uh, over the hair cells, and I'm going to give you an analogy for this in a minute as well. Now, the scala tympani, that takes the, the round window, dissipates pressure waves. Pressure waves are conducted out to the round window, allows that to be given off, and it has berry lymph. We already saw that. Now, so what we're going to see here is that step back and take this inner ear out, our cochlea and everything out. Here we have our stapes, and it's on the oval window. And it's like a toilet plunger, vibrating in and out here, sloshing the fluid found inside the scala vestibule or vestibular duct. That pressure travels through the, uh, through the cochlea, spiraling through, spiraling through. And then the cochlear duct is just under that. 
And then at the very, very bottom is your tympanic duct. And what's going to happen is your cochlear duct here is going to get stimulated by these pressure waves moving around them, shaking it, making it like wavy gravy, and it's going to allow a stimulus to be produced. I'm going to show you how that happens. So let's get that, uh, let's get that vestibular duct, cochlear duct, tympanic duct. Vestibular, cochlear, tympanic okay we have all that going around here spiraling through neurons coming from the we're going to corti in if we were to zoom in now you're going to see that basilar membrane and vestibular membrane in the two ducts and now we can see the tectorial membrane now if we zoom in one more time here we have the organ of corti organ of corti would spiral through the entirety of the cochlea now this thing is like an old timey telegraph that you guys might see in an old western movie and let's say we have we're dodge city and we need to get wyatt earp to come into dodge city and come and save everything we got to get him to wyatt earp to come to tombstone Come on in, Wyatt. Send help. SOS. Save our stuff. Come in, Wyatt Earp. Well, if you spoke, um, if you guys understood um, uh, uh, basic um, uh, Morse code, you wouldn't know that. But anyway, so it acts kind of like an old timey telegraph where these hair cells will vibrate and collide against this tectorial membrane. And as they do, that bends these cilia, vibrates these cilia moving them, stimulating the hair cell, making those hair cells send new signals to the nerve fibers, whether those signals are frequent or not, whether there's a lot of hair cells or not, and where at inside the cochlea we stimulate them tells me something about the sound that I heard. And in lecture, if you haven't listened to lecture yet, you'll hear more about that as we go along. So basically, the red line here, this is your tympanic membrane, or eardrum. The first line here, this represents my uh, malus, then my incus, then my stapes. Stapes is sitting here on my oval window. And as sound hits, it vibrates, creating pressure in the, uh, in the vestibular duct. And as that pressure moves to the tympanic duct and the round window here, that distorts this line here, the cochlear duct, causing a rhythmic stimulation that will be perceived as a sound wave as what I'm hearing, okay, as this constantly produces sound. And you can see that kind of working. This is a little bit how it works. I like to think it's, it kind of reminds me of a steam train engine, just okay. So, and the eyes, that is it. Uh, really wasn't that bad. Um, ear, now I will have a separate recording going over all the, uh, all the stuff, all the, um, uh, things that, uh, but anyway, all the course stuff, but that is really it. Um, now what you'll want to do after this lab is to, one thing, uh, go down here. This tells you some things I'm going to expect you guys to, be able to do for my lab exam. Here's a practice to identify that this is not on the test. But every image here, these are diagrams that could be on my test. Then I have you guys go and practice those things. But also label these diagrams. Uh, mo these models will also be there. So uh, now, um, if you go into my content section, you're going to see these all labeled with things I've already went over, so the answers are there, and you can look them up and label this. One of the things I always tell my students if you're studying is when you print these out in color, take this picture slide separately, slide it into a sheet protector, and get like a dry erase marker right on the sheet protector, label it, wipe it off, label it, wipe it off, label it, and keep doing it till you got them. And you can label all these, and you'll see examinations with these images in them, and that's how I'm going to do your exams in lab and lecture. Now, you'll look on your uh, uh, news items for your schedule for lecture and lab. Uh, this is a combined lecture lab. It's very difficult the way they do this. You basically have to do your exams, lab exam and lecture exams on the same day, and I was, I'm actually told that I have to do my exams on the dates that are given uh, because that's what the testing center or proctoring services that I'm working with will work with. So, 
Um, but beyond that, that concludes his first video over the ear. Uh, then you'll, after you're done, go over those things, listen to this as many times as you like, then go over the pictures, uh, these models of the ear, get those things, practice it, check yourself, keep going, but you'll be able to do fine with this portion there if you can do that. Thank you guys and have a great day.